thanks for inviting me tonight. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I should say Paul has asked us to keep our opening remarks to five or six minutes. And if you remember from your college classes, uh, professors never only speak for five or six minutes. So you're at risk here for yourself. So I'd like, uh, as an economist, I'd like to speak to you briefly about some of the economic drivers of the phenomenon that we're seeing that we refer to as uh, schools to prison. And uh, these phenomenon are both uh, global and they are local, but the bottom line is that this problem is becoming more and more serious uh, every year in our local economy and in our national economy, and it's due to some factors that are beyond our control. If you look at what the data tell us, uh, taking unemployment, looking at the most recent month for the U.S., July 2015, if you were not a high school graduate, then your average unemployment rate was 8.3% among that population. High school graduates, 5.5%. But if you have a Bachelor of Arts or Science, unemployment rates among that population were 2.8%. So what we see is that for less than a high school uh, diploma, unemployment rates are three times what they are for university graduates. And in addition to triple the likelihood of uh, being unemployed, we also find that wages are substantially different. The most recent statistics suggest that if we, for every dollar that a high school graduate earns, someone who has not yet graduated high school earns about 71 cents in the labor market. While for every dollar that a high school graduate earns, somebody with a bachelor's degree earns about $1.66. So the economic implications of the failure to complete and the failure to thrive are profound. And largely, it's due to the changing nature of the job market. If you look at the nature of tasks that can be automated or shipped offshore in the US economy, what you see is that those are tasks which are typically repetitive in nature and do not necessarily require a large amount of discretion in doing those sorts of tasks. Those were the first jobs to be automated or to be shipped offshore. And so they disproportionately affected um, people in manufacturing because those jobs are relatively straightforward to, uh, to automate. And what this meant, for example, is that the historic migration of African Americans out of the South uh, that occurred uh, beginning a century ago and lasted for decades, that went to what we now call the Rust Belt, uh, the, the, the cities of uh, from Pennsylvania to Ohio to Indiana to Illinois, what that meant then was that an education was the route upward in those communities and that increasingly people with less than a high school degree find themselves at risk of increased unemployment, unable to make a living, unable to earn the American dream to provide for their families. There is increased segregation in our economy today. And it turns out to be racial, and a lot of that is due to the fact that African Americans are disadvantaged in the uh, grade school to high school process. What the studies suggest is that there is no attainment gap in early years of childhood between black and white children. However, that attainment gap in terms of standard measures of learning capacity becomes more pronounced over time, suggesting that this is a socialized concept that has nothing to do with uh, birth, but instead is learned behavior that then, by the time uh, we go into high school, there are uh, profound distinctions that show up in high school graduation rates, uh, that show up in subsequent rates of incarceration, and then show up as loss of lifetime earning capacity in today's job market where people who do not have skills that are unique, who do not have skills that require extensive face-to-face -face sorts of job contact, but instead are routine and ordinary, those people face diminished job prospects. Um, then if we look at the cost of the, uh, of the justice system itself, in the school to prison pipeline. What we find uh, right here uh, in Escambia County, if you can just, you just take the annual operating cost for the jail and divide it by the number of inmates that are there, what you find is it's over $30,000 per inmate to house 
inmates in this warehousing process. And so when you combine the lost output for people whose lives are not able to reach their potential, either socially or in the workplace, when you combine that with the direct cost to society of running the jail, of running the court system, of all the things that go from court fees to lawyers to restitution to probationary fees, and then what it does to families, the loss of an earning adult in the household, uh, the, the charges for supporting that individual while they are incarcerated, uh, which include visitation, commissary, etc. those costs add up and they occur across the dimensions of our lives. They're incurred by individuals, they're incurred by individuals' families, and they're incurred by the taxpayer. What that suggests to me as an economist is that this is potentially one of the most fruitful areas, one of the most high return areas to figure out the correct solution because the costs are incurred in so many different places that if we can find correct alternatives that are able to keep kids in school till they get their degrees and enter the workforce productively, if we're able to find alternatives to incarceration for nonviolent crimes, then these are things which are likely to have a very high return on investment relative to some of the other policies that we could equally well spend our money on. So those are my opening remarks, Lisa. Thank you very much.